Hi everyone, and welcome to Lazy Lion. As you could probably guess from the title, this animated feature film is about vampires. But not your typical Twilight vamps. We're talking about grotesque, ripped shreds creatures called Tropterids. The year is 1966 and the Vietnam War is underway. We learned that the Yokota Air Base in Japan has become the new feeding ground for a Tropterra. Enter our protagonist, a mysterious girl named Saya. All we initially know about her is that she seems to be working with the US government to hunt down Chiropterids, and that she wields a katana sword. The government department that she works for doesn't have jurisdiction in the military base, so they send Saya undercover to the school next door as a high school student. Real 21 Jump Street. We won't go much further into the plot, since this feature film is pretty short, only being 45 minutes long. But suffice it to say that Blood the Last Vampire is worth your time. I mean, who doesn't want to see a badass female slaying vampires with a katana sword? Some things to know about the film Blood the Last Vampire. First off, it came out in the year 2000, where it premiered at the Fantasia Film Festival in our home city of Montreal, Canada. This was only one phase of the master plan by studio production IG to reach an international audience. Did we just mention Production IG? That's right we did! Now, for those of you who follow our blog, you'll know that when it comes to Studio Production IG, you're in for a visual treat, and Blow the Last Vampire is no exception. Production IG did a stellar job yet again, and it was all thanks to the great efforts of a talented group of people. The project all started when Mitsuhida Ishikawa, Production IG's president, was looking to create an anime that was fresh and original and not a remake of a manga or a video game. To get some ideas for a new story, Ishikawa approached Mamoru Oshii, who you may recognize as the director of the Ghost in the Shell animated movies. At the time, Oshii was teaching a class on filmmaking, and Ishikawa asked if Oshii's students could submit movie ideas to him. Out of all the students' submissions, two were chosen, that of Kenji Kamiyama and Junichi Fujisaki, their ideas became the core for the film's concept, a girl in a sailor suit wielding a samurai sword. Ishikawa then suggested the story should take place in Japan's state of California, the military airbase in Yakota. Finally, this new fresh story was taking shape. The next step was to bring in Hiroyuki Kitakubo, who had previously worked on the classic Akira with Katsuhiro Otomo to be the film's director. If you're curious about Akira, we actually have a video all about it. We'll leave the link for you at the end. Knowing that Ishikawa's goal for the film was for it to reach international markets, Kitakubo then in turn chose Katsuya Terada, a video game designer, to create the character designs. Kitakubo felt that Terada's talent for drawing universal characters would be a great asset to the production. The next member of the team that Kitakubo brought in was Kuzuchika Kize who would lend his talents as an animation director to the project. Together, they created a film that was animated entirely with computers instead of using the more traditional techniques of cell animation. Which, being big fans of cell animation here, we were surprised by the overall quality and smoothness of the computer animation. The quality of the art is impeccable. To achieve this, they inked and painted each drawing before animating it with computers. The resulting imagery is rich, and the dark colors set the atmosphere perfectly. The next part of their genius plan to infiltrate the international markets was that they decided to have the whole movie in English, with only a few parts in Japanese with English subtitles. This was a brilliant idea, and we're guessing that their plan worked, since this was one of the very first anime films we ever saw as kids growing up in North America. Now, the best part of this movie is hands down Saya. She's so cool that as a kid, I wanted to cosplay as her for Halloween. Though, it was pretty much guaranteed that 99% of my peers would have been confused and thought, who the heck is Saya? And they wouldn't have been wrong, because who is Saya really? Honestly, we don't really know much, and we probably aren't meant to. Saya looks human, and yet there's something about her aura that indeniably screams at something more. Something powerful. We see that she's quick and fearless, as well as strong. She's also calm and calculated, 
only making moves that bring her closer to her goal of eradicating the Chiropterids. We don't even know why that's her goal, only that she seems to be on a mission. And if it weren't for the fact that the US government has a similar goal, she probably wouldn't even be working with them at all. Saya gives off some serious lone wolf vibes. She's actually more of an anti-hero if anything, but her standoffish attitude towards everyone around her might be more of a cruel to be kind type scenario. The world she lives in is dangerous, so it might actually be a kindness when she pushes others away instead of feeling any real disregard for them. She might feel like it's easier to walk her path alone. But again, we don't know. This is all just speculation. If you have your own insight, feel free to share it with us in the comments. We can't even tell you, without a doubt, if she's a vampire, because it's never confirmed. All we get are little hints, here and there, like in the title, The Last Vampire or when one of her US handlers, David, makes a comment to his colleague that she might be the last true original. Or the photo taken in 1892 that the government shows the school nurse with a girl who looks just like Saya and the word vampire written overhead. Or even the fact that Saya gets visibly agitated when people bring up God and religion. Again, all we get are these hints. No one ever just comes out and says, Saya's a vampire. This could be because the original plan for the film was for it to be a three-part story. Kitakubo states that he had worked out her whole backstory and that it was up to those in charge if there would be an animated sequel. Instead, in a weird choice, Production IG decided to give us some light novels, a manga, video games, spin-off animated TV series, and even a live-action film. They gave us all these adaptations, and still, none of our questions about the movie were answered. If anything, they made the lore even more convoluted and confusing, since most of the adaptations take place in alternate universes. Honestly, why do anime studios continue to do this? Do people even like alternate reality adaptations? Or is it just more frustrating for the fans? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We're curious to know if some people actually do enjoy these. Personally, we would much rather have had another adventure featuring the original Saya from the movie. Even a 30 minute OVA would have been better. Huh. Another thing that makes Saya so interesting is her choice in weapons, the katana sword. She's not the first vampire wielding a katana who's hell bent on killing evil bloodsuckers nor hopefully the last. But why choose a katana? We believe that the katana wasn't only chosen for the purpose of adding to Saya's overall badassery, but actually also because it has a practical purpose as well. At one moment, Saya explains that bullets are useless against a Chiroptera, and that the only way to kill one is by dealing a single blow that causes extreme blood loss. This makes the katana an ideal choice, with its strength, flexibility, and sharpness, it's the optimal weapon for killing Chiropterids. She may need to get in close and personal, but at least there's the added bonus of never running out of ammo. The Chiropterids are extremely strong themselves though, so breaking katanas during a fight is a possibility, as seen during the movie. We also see that Saya and her handlers struggle with acquiring new swords. In the other adaptations, they allude to the fact that her weapon is custom made for her using specific properties which only she can make use of, yada yada yada. For this movie though, we don't think that's the case. Because we see her break into an antique shop to steal one, only to later be irritated when it proves to be a fake. So if there's nothing special about her sword, why is it so notoriously difficult to find a replacement? We think that the answer to that can be found in history. Throughout Japanese history, there have been many sword hunts. This is when the Japanese government would demand that everyone turn in their samurai swords and would forbid people from carrying them around in public. This was mainly done in order to prevent the nobles and the people from rebelling against the emperor. Then, during the 1870s, Japan was undergoing a process of westernization and the samurai profession was abolished. Samurai were now encouraged to cut off their top knots and adopt a more modern look. If you've seen the movie The Last Samurai, you may have some idea about what we're talking about. The last sword hunt took place between 1945 to 1953, 
and was carried out by General Douglas MacArthur, who was the effective leader of Japan during the American occupation. Samurai swords were banned and confiscated, and during this time, many priceless swords were lost. Some were thrown into the Gulf of Tokyo, while others were melted down. This continued for a long time until one brave Japanese man came forward and pleaded with MacArthur to stop, telling him that the swords were family heirlooms and seen as great treasures. After this, the destruction of the swords stopped and instead the Allied forces were allowed to take them back home as souvenirs. Tracking them down from veterans and collectors can be time consuming and expensive. To be able to find any remaining katana swords in Japan during 1966 would have been a miracle. Good job, David. The creators of Blood the Last Vampire said that they drew inspiration from Bram Stoker's Dracula and the hit TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But there's also a clever nod to Frankenstein's monster. While Saya is undercover at the school, she attends a class where they're discussing Mary Shelley's classic novel, Frankenstein. A prominent theme in the book is creation. We see this when Victor Frankenstein brings a dead corpse made up of mangled body parts to life. But his delight at finally achieving his goal is quickly replaced by horror when the consequences of what he's actually done dawns on him. He was so focused on bringing an inanimate body to life that he never thought of what he would actually do once he was successful. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. We believe that the production team didn't choose to mention Mary Shelley's classic merely to add to the spooky Halloween atmosphere of the film, but actually included it as a clue to the origins of the Chiropterids. A sort of foreshadowing, if you will. It's mentioned in the various adaptations that in the quest for immortality, humans studied the blood of the true originals. In the process of recreating its properties, they inadvertently gave life to the Chiropterids. We're guessing that this was all going to get explained in the sequels, but of course, since they were never created, we will never really know for sure. All we have are calculated guesses. Despite not having any sequels though, the standalone film Blood the Last Vampire doesn't suffer from it and still makes our list of must-watch anime films. Its story pulls you in and the animation is superb. We couldn't get enough of it. That being said, we can't exactly say the same for the adaptations. In our personal opinion, they don't add much to the original work, seeing as they don't take place in the same universe. They also veer away from all the things that make Saya so interesting, which is disappointing. I can personally attest to this since I've watched some of the animated series adaptations, the live action film, and read the manga, while others on the team smartly wouldn't touch them with a 10 foot pole. In closing, we hope you found this video informative. If you did, feel free to click the like button to let us know. And if you want to see more content like this, you can check out our video on Akira, another great anime movie. Or if anybody's interested in seeing some of our other content, such as comics, or you just want to know a little more about us, you can check out our blog at marrowmanias.com. Thanks for watching. Stay obsessed.